Hello hockey fans and welcome back to another video. The 2022 free agency window has been in full swing for nearly a week now, and while we have already seen over 200 contracts and over $1.1 billion handed out to players, some of these deals are bound to age far better than others. Now instead of looking at every single signing from the current window and deciding which teams won or lost the event, I want to talk about some different free agent signings instead. Rather than focusing on this year's event, I want to dive back into the history books and take a look at some of the worst free agent signings the league has ever seen. And what better way to do that than by highlighting the worst deal from every single NHL team. After all, whether they were paid far more than their role is typically worth, they dealt with numerous injuries throughout their contract, or they couldn't live up to their hefty salary, every team has signed a free agent that they would later go on to regret. So why not scrape the bottom of the barrel and take a look at the worst of the worst, right? But how bad could these contracts possibly be? Surely they aren't as terrible as you might think, right? Well strap yourselves in ladies and gentlemen, cause this one's gonna be one hell of a bumpy ride. So in today's video, join me as we explore every NHL team's worst free agency signing ever. Now before we begin, I just want to mention that I've prioritised discussing longer contracts with sizeable salaries over shorter and cheaper deals that didn't work out, as there is a greater expectation for a player to step up and produce for his team when they are signed for a long time and for a lot of money too. So while some of these deals may have turned out better than some shorter term contracts, they still didn't quite live up to expectations. Not only that, this video only contains players who signed with a team after leaving their previous franchise as a free agent, so there are no contract extensions just before a player hit free agency, and no players who tested the market only to return to their previous franchise shortly after. Now while some teams worst signings ever may have come through these methods, we are only looking at UFAs who left their previous team and signed with a completely different side once the free agency window opened. Does that make sense to you? I really hope it does because that's what we're doing. Oh and this entire video is purely my opinion, so if you disagree with a contract that I have picked, or you think that there's a worse one than I could have chosen instead, do feel free to let me know in the comments below. After all, several different teams have signed a plethora of abysmal small contracts over the years, so trying to decide which one is the worst of them is a near impossible task, you know? Now that's out of the way, let's get on with the video, shall we? Kicking things off with the Anaheim Ducks, we have Sergei Fedorov. Now Fedorov may be one of the greatest players that the NHL has ever seen, but his stint in Anaheim is one that both sides wish they could forget. After spending the first 13 years of his NHL career with the Detroit Red Wings organization, and after producing a high-scoring, trophy-filled tenure with the team, Fedorov signed a five-year, $26.2 million contract with the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim, worth an average annual value of $5.2 million on July 19th, 2003. Though he would produce a strong debut season with the Ducks, by potting 31 goals and 65 points in 80 regular season games, Fedorov would see a notable reduction in his scoring compared to his final year with the Red Wings, and he was unable to completely fill the shoes of recent departure and Ducks legend Paul Correa. Now while his on-ice play appeared to be business as usual, Fedorov's off-ice behaviour quickly caught the ire of the Ducks management. According to Ducks general manager at the time, Brian Burke, Fedorov appeared to be less interested in contributing to his team and more focused on enjoying the Los Angeles nightlife, as he would ride back to his house in limos at 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning on game days. In fact, Burke became so concerned with Fedorov's behaviour that he supposedly sent rookie forwards Ryan Getzlaff and Corey Perry back down to the minors with the sole purpose of keeping them away from his bad influence for fear of them following his lead. After playing the first five games of the 05-06 season with Anaheim, and after scoring a single point during that span, Fedorov would be traded to the Columbus Blue Jackets on November 15th, 2005. And thus ended Fedorov's tenure with the Anaheim Ducks. Sure, his time with Anaheim wasn't ideal, and this contract was a huge mistake for them in hindsight, but at least you can say that his tenure with the team was pretty eventful, right? Next up from the Arizona Coyotes, we have Brett Hull. Wait, Brett Hull played for the Coyotes? When did that happen? Well, you probably don't remember his tenure with the team, because it ended just as quickly as it began. 
Having spent the prior three years with the Detroit Red Wings, and having won his second Stanley Cup championship with the team, Hull signed a two-year, $4.5 million contract with Arizona, then known as the Phoenix Coyotes, worth an average annual value of $2.25 million a year on August 7th, 2004. After the first year of his deal was lost due to the 0405 lockout, Hull would finally join the Coyotes for the following 0506 NHL season. However, after playing just five games with the team, and after recording a single point during that span, Hull would decide to hang up his skates and retire from the NHL on October 15th, 2005. Sure, Brett Hull is known as one of the greatest goal scorers that the league has ever seen, but if his tenure with the Coyotes wasn't a complete and utter disaster, I don't know what is. I mean, over $4 million for five regular season games and a single point? That's a terrible waste of money, lockout or not. Moving on to the Boston Bruins, we have Martin Lapointe. Now, if you're looking for a prime example of why overpaying for a free agent might not be the best idea, look no further than Martin Lapointe. After spending the first eight years of his NHL career with Detroit, and having posted back-to-back 40-point -back seasons, Lapointe signed a four-year, $20 million contract with Boston, worth an average annual value of $5 million a year on July 9th, 2001. Though he would produce a decent debut season with the Bruins, thanks to his 17 goals and 40 points in 68 games during the 01-02 NHL season, Lapointe would register just 43 points in 137 games over the next two years, before the 04-05 lockout wiped out the final year of his deal. Given just how much he had regressed over his three years with the team, I don't think that Boston were too upset to lose the final year of his services, do you? Kinda sounds to me like they dodged a bullet, you know? Next, from the Buffalo Sabres, we have Ville Leno. Now, some players seem to break out at the right time, sign a huge deal in free agency, and never live up to their new hefty salary. And if Ville Leno isn't the perfect example of this, I don't know who is. After spending the previous year and a half with the Philadelphia Flyers, after potting 21 points in 19 games during the 2010 Stanley Cup playoffs, and after scoring 53 points in 81 games during the following 10-11 NHL season, Leno signed a six-year, $27 million contract with Buffalo, worth an average annual value of $4.5 million a season on July 1st, 2011. Unfortunately for both the player and his new organization though, this deal wouldn't work out in the several seasons that followed. And I mean, it really, really didn't work out. After potting 46 points in 137 games over the next three years with the team, and after failing to score a single goal during the 13-14 season, Buffalo would place Leno on unconditional waivers and buy out the final two years of his contract with the team, a move that would ultimately end his NHL career. Given his lackluster performance over the course of the contract, and given his eventual buyout just three years into the deal, there is a legitimate argument to be made that Leno's contract was one of the worst free agent signings in the history of the NHL. Well, at least the Sabres learned their lesson, and they didn't make the same mistake in the future, right? Right? Now, from the Calgary Flames, we have Troy Brower. What's that? Signing a 31-year-old depth forward to an expensive contract didn't work out? Well, colour me shocked, folks. After producing 39 points with the St. Louis Blues during the prior 15-16 NHL season, and having scored 30 points or more in each of his last seven years, Brower signed a four-year, $18 million contract with Calgary, worth an average annual value of $4.5 million a season on July 1st, 2016. Having joined the Flames roster for the very first time, Brower would struggle to live up to his new deal almost immediately, as he scored 47 points in 150 games games over two seasons with the team, before Calgary placed him on waivers and bought out the final two years of his deal. Did this signing work out in the long run? No, not really. Was it the worst deal in NHL history? Probably not. But was it a terrible mistake that was easily avoidable? Yes. Yes, it was. Next up, from the Carolina Hurricanes, we have Jake Gardner. Now, Gardner's signing may be one of the most recent deals to feature in this video, but that doesn't mean that it's fared any better than the other entries, at least at the time of this recording anyway. After spending the first eight years of his NHL career with the Toronto Maple Leafs, and having potted four consecutive 30-point seasons, 
Gardner signed a four-year, $16.2 million contract with Carolina, worth an average annual value of just over $4 million a season on September 6th, 2019. From there, Gardner would join the Hurricanes and score just 32 points in 94 games over the next two seasons, before injuries to his hip and back forced him onto long-term injured reserve and sidelined him for the entirety of the recent 21-22 season. Though Gardner still has one year remaining on his deal, and while it's certainly possible that he could bounce back during the upcoming 22-23 season, given that he didn't play a single game last year, and given that his career could be all but over by this point, I don't think we should hold out too much hope, you know. At least his $4 million salary should soften the blow, right guys? Now, from the Chicago Blackhawks, we have Theo Fleury. Known equally for his strong on-ice play as his questionable antics off it, Fleury's tenure in Chicago would be quite the disappointment for both the player and his new organization. After spending the last three seasons with the New York Rangers, and after scoring at least 63 points in every year with the team, Fleury signed a two-year, $8.5 million contract with Chicago, worth an average annual value of $4.25 million a season on August 16th, 2002. However, just two days before the 0203 NHL season began, Fleury was suspended by the league for violating the terms of their substance abuse program for the 14th time in his career. Having missed the opening two months of the season due to his suspension, Fleury would finally join the Blackhawks roster. And though he would score 33 points in 54 games with the team, his off-ice issues would continue, as he was supposedly involved in a drunken brawl, which he later described as one of the lowest points in his life. Once his debut year with Chicago had concluded, Fleury was suspended by the NHL once again for violating their substance abuse program, a move that would ultimately end his NHL career. Sure, Fleury didn't live up to his contract on the ice, and he had his fair share of issues off it, but thankfully, he seems to have finally conquered his demons, and he has battled through his substance abuse. So here's hoping that he continues down the road to recovery moving forwards. Perhaps there is a happy ending here after all. Moving on to the Colorado Avalanche, we have Ryan Smith. Another example of a seemingly great deal being ruined by injuries, Ryan Smith's time in Colorado left many fans wondering what could have been. After spending the first decade of his NHL career with the Edmonton Oilers, and after finishing the 06-07 NHL season with the New York Islanders, Smith signed a five-year, $31.2 million contract with Colorado, worth an average annual value of $6.25 million a season on July 1st, 2007. From there, Smith spent the next two seasons with the Avalanche, suffered several notable injuries during that span, and scored 96 points in 132 games before being traded to the Los Angeles Kings on July 3rd, 2009. Certainly not the worst signing in this video by any stretch, but not exactly what you want from a guy you had signed for half a decade and had expected to be a star for your team. Ah well, you win some, you lose some. Next, from the Columbus Blue Jackets, we have Nathan Horton. Now, if you thought Ryan Smith's ailments ruined his contract, Nathan Horton's injuries would prematurely end his NHL career. It's just a shame he signed a huge contract in Columbus just before they did so. After spending the prior three seasons with the Boston Bruins, and having helped the team lift the 2011 Stanley Cup, Horton signed a seven-year, $37.1 million contract with Columbus, worth an average annual value of $5.3 million a season on July 5th, 2013. Unfortunately though, this deal would become a huge mistake almost immediately after it was signed. Having joined the Blue Jackets roster, Horton suited up in just 36 games with the team and scored 19 points during that span before a degenerative back injury forced him onto LTIR and effectively ended his NHL career. Now while I would love to give Horton a pass here since he never got the chance to live up to his deal due to injuries, he has to be included in this video as this contract was a complete and utter disaster, whether it was his fault or not. Sorry Horton, but that's just the way it is, okay? Now from the Dallas Stars we have Sean Avery. Known more for his unique on-ice antics than his actual career numbers, Dallas would regret adding Avery to their roster just as quickly as they signed him. 
having spent the last season and a half with the New York Rangers, and having registered 212 penalty minutes in 86 games during that span, Avery signed a four-year, $15.5 million contract with Dallas, worth an average annual value of $3.8 million on July 2nd, 2008. So, would this deal work out? No. No, it wouldn't. After playing 23 games with the team, and after scoring 10 points during that span, Avery was suspended by the league following his controversial remarks surrounding fellow players dating his ex-girlfriends. Once his suspension was finally lifted six months after the incident, the Stars placed Avery on waivers on February 7th, 2009, where he eventually rejoined the Rangers shortly after. So while Avery's tenure in Dallas was very short, it was far from being sweet. I guess his return to New York made him the sloppy seconds after all. Moving on to the Detroit Red Wings, we have Darian Hatcher. One of the NHL's hardest hitting defensemen during the 90s and early 2000s, Darian Hatcher would be unable to make quite the same impact during his brief tenure in hockey town. After spending the first 12 years of his NHL career with the Dallas Stars organization, and after registering 106 penalty minutes during the 02-03 NHL season, Hatcher signed a five-year, $30 million contract with Detroit, worth an average annual value of $6 million a season on July 3rd, 2003. From there, Hatcher would suffer a knee injury in just his third game with the organization, he would play only 15 regular season games that year, and he would register four points during that span before the 04-05 lockout eliminated the sophomore season of his deal. Once the lockout came to an end and the salary cap was introduced, Detroit would place Hatcher on waivers and buy out the final three years of his deal. When you play more games for their minor league team than you do for their NHL roster, you know that your contract hasn't quite gone to plan, has it? There's certainly better ways to spend $6 million a season, that's for sure. Next up, from the Edmonton Oilers, we have Sheldon Sore. Yet another victim of the injury bug, Sheldon Sore's stint in Edmonton is one that either side would like to forget, and for pretty good reason too. Having spent five and a half seasons with the Montreal Canadiens, and having potted 64 points in 81 games during the 06-07 season, Sore signed a five-year, $27 million contract with Edmonton, worth an average annual value of $5.4 million a year on July 12th, 2007. Unfortunately though, this deal wouldn't work out for both the player and his new organization. After playing just 144 games over the next three seasons due to injuries, and having scored only 76 points during that span, Sore would spend the following year down in the minors before Edmonton bought out the final season of his deal. So if it wasn't bad enough that he missed nearly half of his team's fixtures over a three-year span, Sore spent an entire season in the AHL and was even bought out too. Does that sound like a $5 million a year player to you? Because it sure as hell doesn't to me. Now from the Florida Panthers, we have Dave Boland. Oh great, another deal that didn't work out due to injuries. We haven't had enough of those already, have we? After playing the first six years of his NHL career with the Chicago Blackhawks organization, after winning two Stanley Cup championships with the team, and after spending the 13-14 NHL season with the Toronto Maple Leafs, Boland signed a five-year, $27.5 million contract with the Panthers, worth an average annual value of $5.5 million a season on July 1st, 2014. Though he would spend the next two seasons on the Panthers roster, and though he would score 28 points in 88 games with the team, severe injuries to his back and ankle forced Boland onto long-term injured reserve and made him unofficially retire from the league less than halfway through this deal. Whilst this clearly isn't the way that anybody would have liked this deal to end, you can't really fault Boland for how his tenure in Florida paid out. I mean, the guy literally couldn't be cleared to play in the NHL. It's probably a miracle that he suited up in as many games as he did, let alone register some semblance of point production. At least he has his two Stanley Cup rings to keep him company. It's just a shame that he didn't win either of them with the Panthers. It might have made this behemoth of a contract a little easier to swallow. Moving on to the LA Kings, we have Rob Blake. One of the more successful defensemen in this video from a point production standpoint, Rob Blake may have fared better than most, but he still didn't live up to his hefty salary. 
after spending four and a half years with the Colorado Avalanche and having potted 45 points or more in each of those seasons, Blake signed a two-year, $12 million contract with LA worth an average annual value of $6 million a season on July 1st, 2006. Though he would play the entirety of this contract with the Kings, and though he would score 65 points in 143 games during that span, this production would be seen as somewhat of a disappointment, especially since he potted 97 points in 155 games during his prior two years with Colorado. Sure, Blake could have done far worse for himself, and this deal wasn't as bad as some of the other entries in this video, but you expect more than a clear step backwards offensively from a two-way defenseman making $6 million a season, you know? I mean, it's bad enough to be considered the LA Kings' worst free agent signing ever, so he must have done something wrong, right? Next up from the Minnesota Wild, we have Zach Parise and Ryan Suter. The only entry to feature more than one player, Zach Parise and Ryan Suter have both earned a place in this video thanks to them signing identical contracts with the Wild that both went just as bad as each other. After spending the first seven years of their NHL careers with the New Jersey Devils and the Nashville Predators respectively, Parise and Suta each signed a 13-year, $98 million contract with Minnesota worth an average annual value of $7.5 million a season on July 4th, 2012. Though both players would produce respectable tenures with the Wild, and though they would help the team clinch a postseason berth in seven of their nine seasons with Minnesota, neither player would take their game to the next level or live up to their lofty salary in the long run. After nearly a decade with the organization, both players were eventually placed on unconditional waivers and bought out of their respective contracts on July 13th, 2021. Sure, Parise and Suter had their fair share of success in Minnesota, and they certainly could have performed a lot worse, but the sheer length of these deals and the sizable cap hit they carried meant that both players were all but destined to fail. I guess they fit in pretty well with Minnesota then, didn't they? Oh, I'm only joking, Wild fans. But we all know it's true, right? Now, from the Montreal Canadiens, we have Carl Olsner. The Habs may have existed for well over a century now, but none of their signings seem to have aged quite as badly as Olsner's did. I can't tell whether that makes it incredibly embarrassing or surprisingly impressive. Maybe both? I don't know, let me know in the comments, okay? After spending the first nine years of his NHL career with the Washington Capitals, and after registering two 21-point seasons in the last three years, Olsner signed a five-year, $23.1 million contract with the Habs, worth an average annual value of $4.6 million a season on July 1st, 2017. From there, Olsner would play just 95 NHL games over the next three seasons due to his lackluster play, and he scored just 13 points during that span, before Montreal placed him on unconditional waivers and bought out the final two years of his deal on October 7th, 2020, a move that ultimately ended his NHL career. Considering that he played nearly as many games in the minors as he did for the Habs over the course of this deal, this contract really didn't work out, did it? Safe to say that the only person to benefit from this signing was Carl Olsner himself. I mean, the guy made over $23 million. I wouldn't be complaining if I was him. Moving on to the Nashville Predators, we have Victor Stolberg. Now, while he may not be the first player that comes to mind when you think Nashville Predators and bad free agent signings, Victor Stolberg made such a a little impact for Nashville that his deal has aged far worse than any other candidate. After spending three seasons with the Chicago Blackhawks, and after helping the team lift the 2013 Stanley Cup, Stolberg signed a four-year, $12 million contract with the Predators, worth an average annual value of $3 million a season on July 5th, 2013. From there, Stolberg would play the next two seasons with Nashville and score just 30 points in 100 games with the team before the Predators bought out the final two years of his deal on June 30th, 2015. Sure, Stolberg's contract isn't the worst one in this video, and you could certainly make an argument that Matt Duchesne or Ryan Johansson belong here instead, but given that both of those players have provided some sort of value for Nashville over the course of their deals, is far better than Victor Stolberg ever did, especially during the recent 21-22 season. I mean, those guys were on fire this year. 
Next up from the New Jersey Devils, we have Anton Volchenkov. One of the more obscure entries in this video, Anton Volchenkov has earned his place thanks to his inability to live up to his contract in New Jersey. After spending the first seven seasons of his NHL career with the Ottawa Senators, and having earned a reputation as a reliable defensive defenseman, Volchenkov signed a six-year, $25.5 million contract with the Devils, worth an average annual value of $4.25 million a season on July 1st, 2010. Now, while his 32 point in 222 regular season games over the next four years might not seem like much, Volchenkov was known for his shutdown ability and his effectiveness in his own zone. So while his numbers could have been better, they certainly could have been worse. That said, what wasn't excusable was his declining defensive play over the course of this deal, as once it was clear that he had taken a sizable step backwards, New Jersey placed Volchenkov on unconditional waivers and bought out the final two years of his deal on July 7th, 2014. Given that he was never known for his point production, and given that he was a fourth defenseman at best and a bottom pair blue liner at worst, it's a wonder why the Devils paid Volchenkov so much money in the first place. Such is the risk you take when acquiring players through free agency, I guess. Now, from the New York Islanders, we have Andrew Ladd. One of, if not the worst free agent signing of the last decade, Ladd's contract with the Islanders probably couldn't have aged any worse than it did, even if it tried. I mean, to call it a disaster would be the understatement of the year. After spending six seasons with the Winnipeg Jets organization, and having finished the 15-16 NHL season with a brief return to the Chicago Blackhawks, Ladd signed a seven-year, $38.5 million contract with the Islanders, worth an average annual value of $5.5 million a season on July 1st, 2016. And how would this deal turn out? Really bad, actually. Thanks to declining play and sustained injury troubles, Ladd would score just 72 points in 177 games over parts of four seasons with the Islanders, and spend extended periods of time down in the minors, before being traded to the Arizona Coyotes on July 17, 2021. Though Ladd has seemingly fought his way back into the league, and he appears to have found a home for himself in Arizona, you know things haven't worked out when your team is willing to pay you over $5 million a a year to play for their minor league team instead of the NHL roster you originally signed with. It's a good thing he won a few Stanley Cup championships earlier in his career, because his later seasons have been filled with nothing but bitter disappointment. Moving on to the New York Rangers, we have Bobby Holik. The undisputed kings of terrible free agent signings, Bobby Holik is not only the Rangers' worst signing ever, he is arguably one of the worst free agent signings in the history of the NHL. Strap yourselves in, folks. This one's going to be brutal. After spending the first decade of his NHL career with the New Jersey Devils, and having potted 50 points or more in five of his last six seasons, Holik signed a five-year, $45 million contract with the Rangers, worth an average annual value of $9 million a season on July 2nd, 2002. $9 million a year for a 50 to 60 point player? This signing couldn't possibly go wrong, could it? Oh, it could, folks. It really, really could. After spending two seasons in New York, and after scoring only 91 points in 146 games with the team, New York would place Holik on waivers and buy out the final two years of his deal shortly after the 0405 lockout concluded. Sure, Bobby Holik produced a far better tenure on Broadway than some of the other players in this video, and the Rangers have given out plenty of bad contracts to a number of free agents over the years, but given the sizable amount of money that they signed him to, his inability to live up to his hefty salary, and given that they bought him out of his deal several years before its conclusion, this signing is the worst contract in Rangers history by far. At least in my opinion, anyway. Next, from the Ottawa Senators, we have Alexei Kovalev. Now, the Ottawa Senators typically aren't the biggest spenders during free agency, and given how Kovalev's deal worked out for them, perhaps we know why. After spending five years with the Montreal Canadiens, and having registered 65 points or more in three of his last four seasons, Kovalev signed a two-year, $10 million contract with Ottawa, worth an average annual value of $5 million a season on July 6th, 2009. 
though he would spend the next season and a half with the team, and though he would score 76 points in 131 games during that span, Kovalev was traded to the Pittsburgh Penguins before the 2011 NHL trade deadline. Once again, Kovalev's production could have been far worse, but scoring at a point every two game pace while earning $5 million a year and being traded from the team half a season before the contract is over isn't exactly the happy ending that either side was hoping for, was it? Now from the Philadelphia Flyers, we have Ilya Brizgalov. One of the most unintentionally funny players the NHL has ever seen, Ilya Brizgalov's deal with Philly was absolutely hilarious, both in its sheer size as well as how badly it panned out for either side involved. After spending three and a half seasons with the Phoenix Coyotes, and after registering a 130, 93, and 27 record in 257 games with the team, Brizgalov signed a nine year, $51 million contract with Philly, worth an average annual value of $5.6 million a season on June 23rd, 2011. Now, unfortunately for both the player and his new organization, this deal would go very, very badly. After spending just two years with the Flyers organization, and after posting a 52, 33, and 10 record, a 2.60 goals against average, and a 0.905 save percentage in 99 regular season games, Philadelphia placed Brizgalov on unconditional waivers and bought out the final seven years of his contract on June 25th, 2013. It's a good thing that this was a compliance buyout, otherwise Philly would have been forced to take on a $1.6 million cap hit every single year until 2027. That said, the team still owes Brizgalov the rest of his money, and he will continue to receive his yearly paycheck for the next half a decade. So it's safe to say that the netminder got the last laugh here. Moving on to the Pittsburgh Penguins, we have Zygmunt Polfi. Yet another forward who produced impressive scoring numbers throughout his lengthy NHL career, Ziggy Polfi's tenure in Pittsburgh would be confusing to say the least. After spending five seasons with the LA Kings, and having potted 66 points or more in three of those five years, Polfi signed a three-year, $13.5 million contract with Pittsburgh, worth an average annual value of $4.5 million a season, shortly after the 0405 lockout concluded. Though he would produce a red-hot start during his debut year with the team, thanks to potting 42 points in his first 42 games of the season, Polfi would suddenly depart from the Penguins and announce his retirement from the sport. According to Penguins general manager at the time, Craig Patrick, Polfi had told him that he had decided to call it quits due to the lingering effects of a shoulder injury. Sure, Polfi playing only half a season of his three-year deal isn't great, but the forward was clearly living up to the hype. So this is one of the more disappointing entries in this video, as we'll never know just how well this deal could have panned out if he had stuck around for the remainder of his contract. It's a real shame that things ended the way that they did, but scoring at a point per game pace for half a regular season is one of the better ways to hang up your skates, right? Next up from the Seattle Kraken, we have Jaden Schwartz. Ah, oh, come on, odd man rush. Seattle have only been in the NHL for a single season. Surely they can't be included, right? Well, I can't make a video looking at every NHL team's worst signing and leave one team out, can I? So just hear me out on this one, okay? After spending the first decade of his NHL career with the St. Louis Blues and having potted 55 points or more in three of the last five years, Schwartz signed a five-year, $27.5 million contract contract with Seattle, worth an average annual value of $5.5 million a season on July 28th, 2021. However, Schwartz's debut year in Seattle wouldn't quite go to plan, as injuries limited him to just 37 games during the recent 21-22 NHL season, where he scored only 23 points during that span. While Schwartz is only entering the second year of his deal, and he still has plenty of time to live up to this contract, given that he missed more than half of the regular season due to injuries, and given that he will be in his early to mid-30s for the remainder of this deal, I don't think Schwartz's play will end up being worth $5.5 million a season, do you? Moving on to the St. Louis Blues, we have Jay McKee. Now, Jay McKee might not be the most recognisable player in this video, but that didn't stop him from securing quite the contract with the Blues. It's just a shame that he never lived up to it then, isn't it? 
after spending the first nine years of his NHL career with the Buffalo Sabres, and having earned a reputation as a reliable defensive defenseman, McKee signed a four-year, $16 million contract with St. Louis, worth an average annual value of $4 million a season on July 1st, 2006. From there, McKee would play the next three years with the Blues, and scored only 17 points in 158 games during that span, before St. Louis bought out the final year of his deal shortly after the 08 09 season. Sure, McKee clearly didn't live up to his salary when you look at his point production, but given that he had spent his entire career as a shutdown defenseman, St. Louis should never have signed him to such a large contract in the first place. After all, McKee had never scored more than 17 points in a season during his prior 10 years in the league. You clearly know what type of player he is and how much his talents are worth, and it clearly wasn't $4 million a year. Now from the San Jose Sharks, we have Mikhail Bodka. Another more recent signing, Mikhail Bodka's contract certainly isn't the worst entry in this video, but its sheer lack of value for San Jose makes it the worst deal in Sharks history, at least in my opinion anyway. After spending the first seven years of his NHL career with the Arizona Coyotes, and having finished the 15-16 season with the Colorado Avalanche, Bodka signed a four-year, $16 million contract with the Sharks, worth an average annual value of $4 million a season on July 1st, 2016. From there, Bodka would play the next two seasons with the Sharks organization, and thanks to scoring only 63 points in 155 regular season games during that span, the Danish forward was traded to the Ottawa Senators on June 19th, 2018. Once again, Bodka certainly could have played a lot worse for himself, but scoring at less than a point every two game pace isn't exactly what you want from a forward earning $4 million a season, is it? At least the Sharks traded him before it was too late and got something in return. Several other teams in this video weren't so lucky, you know. Next up, from the Tampa Bay Lightning, we have Ryan Malone. Now, I may have cheated a little bit with this one, since Malone was traded to Tampa as a pending UFA and signed with the Lightning the following day. But given the sheer size of his contract and just how badly he regressed over the course of the deal, I had to choose him as Tampa's worst signing. After spending the first four years of his NHL career with the Pittsburgh Penguins, and after scoring 44 points or more in two of the last three years, Malone signed a seven-year, 30 $1.5 million contract with Tampa, worth an average annual value of $4.5 million a season on June 29th, 2008. Though he would spend six years with the Lightning organization, and though he would register three 45-point seasons during his first four years with the team, Malone's production would practically fall off a cliff. After potting 23 points in 81 games over the following two seasons, Tampa would place Malone on unconditional waivers and buy out the final year of his deal on June 25th, 2014. While Tampa received far more from Malone than almost every other entry in this video, when you realize that Malone was arrested for DUI and cocaine possession in April of 2014, his rapid decline on the ice and his subsequent buyout off it start to make a lot more sense, especially after he pleaded no contest to his charges in August of that same year. Well, it's a good thing that he signed for so much money because he probably needed to use a large portion of that to cover his legal fees. Lawyers certainly aren't cheap, you know. Now, from the Toronto Maple Leafs, we have David Clarkson. Oh, look, Toronto signed a player to a massive contract and he didn't pan out. What a surprise. After spending the first seven seasons of his NHL career with the New Jersey Devils, and having potted 70 points in 128 games over his last two seasons in the league, Clarkson signed a seven-year, $35.7 million contract with Toronto, worth an average annual value of $5.25 million a season, on July 5th, 2013. From there, Clarkson played 118 games over the next season and a half with the Leafs and scored only 26 points during that span before being traded to the Columbus Blue Jackets on February 26th, 2015. Though he would eventually return to Toronto in 2019 and he would be forced to spend the rest of his deal on the long-term injured reserve list, scoring 26 points in 118 games with the team that originally signed you simply isn't good enough for a guy making over $5 million a season, injuries or not. This deal was pretty questionable at the time it was signed and it somehow only got worse the longer it went on. So good job Toronto, I guess you'll get it next time, yeah? 
Moving on to the Vancouver Canucks, we have Marc Messier. Now Canucks fans weren't too fond of Messier before this signing, but thanks to his abysmal tenure with Vancouver's organization, Messier is one of, if not the most hated player in franchise history. After spending six seasons with the New York Rangers, and having scored at well over a point per game pace during that span, Messier signed a five year, $30 million contract with Vancouver, worth an average annual value of $6 million a season on July 28th, 1997. Though he would play the next three seasons with the Canucks, and though he would produce 162 points in 207 games with the team, Messier's tenure with Vancouver would be remembered for all the wrong reasons. After all, not only did the Canucks fail to make the playoffs in every year during that span, Messier stole the C from longtime captain Trevor Linden. He wore his iconic number 11, which had been unofficially retired by the organization, while questions were raised about both his on-ice play and his locker room leadership. And that's not even mentioning his injury troubles, his role in getting Mike Keenan hired as the team's head coach, and the subsequent trading of many fan favorite players as a result. So yeah, fans weren't too happy with Messier CA in Vancouver. Following his third season with the team, the Canucks would exercise a $2 million buyout clause of Messier's deal and allowed the forward to enter free agency once again. Given that Canucks fans still hate Messier to this very day, and given that the mere mention of his name makes their blood boil to near dangerous levels, I think it's fair to say that this signing really didn't work out, did it? Next up from the Vegas Golden Knights, we have Vadim Shipachov. Now, the Vegas Golden Knights may have only existed for the last half a decade, but one of their very first signings in franchise history turned out to be their worst by far. After spending the last nine years in the KHL, and having scored at over a point per game pace in each of his last three seasons, Shipachov signed a two-year, $9 million contract with Vegas, worth an average annual value of $4.5 million a season on May 4th, 2017. From there, Shipachov would end up playing just three games on the Golden Knights roster, and scored a single goal during that span, before being placed on waivers and having his contract terminated by the team after Vegas tried to demote him down to the minors. Sure, signing KHL free agents is always a risky venture, despite their high scoring play overseas, and there's no guarantee that they will succeed at the NHL level, but signing Shipachov to a $9 million contract only to play him for three games really isn't a great look for Vegas, is it? You clearly didn't give him over four and a half million dollars a year to ply his trade in the AHL. Give him a chance to prove himself in the show, right? I wish I could say that this was the only time something like this would happen to a member of the Golden Knights roster, but history has shown us time and time again that that simply isn't true. Consider yourself lucky, Shipachov. You may have dodged quite the bullet there, buddy. Penultimately, from the Washington Capitals, we have Michael Nylander. Despite briefly playing for Washington earlier in his career, Nylander's second stint with the Capitals would be just as disappointing, but for completely different reasons. After spending two seasons with the New York Rangers, and having scored at least 79 points in either year with the team, Nylander signed a four-year, $19.5 million contract with Washington, worth an average annual value of $4.8 million a season on July 2nd, 2007. Now, while he would score 70 points in 112 games over the next two seasons with the team, Nylander would end up spending the remainder of his contract on loan, either down in the minors with another team's AHL roster, or overseas in Europe instead. Sure, Nylander produced better scoring numbers for Washington the second time around, but since they were nowhere near his previous levels in New York, and since the Capitals ended up paying him nearly $10 million to play elsewhere in the hockey world, this deal could have gone much better for everybody involved. That said, Nylander did make a decent chunk of change during this span, so at least one positive came from it all. And finally, from the Winnipeg Jets, we have Dmitry Kulakov. Though Kulakov hasn't been known as a promising top four defenseman for many years now, Winnipeg sure decided to pay him like one when the opportunity arose. After spending the first seven years of his NHL career with the Florida Panthers, and having spent the 16-17 season with the Buffalo Sabres, Kulikov signed a three-year, $12 million contract with Winnipeg, worth an average annual value of $4 million a season on July 1st, 2017. 
though he would end up spending the entire contract with the Jets, Kulikov would struggle to establish himself as anything more than a bottom pair defenseman. After scoring 27 points in 170 games over three seasons with Winnipeg, Kulikov would leave the team via free agency on October 22nd, 2020. Now while this contract certainly isn't the worst deal in this video, giving $4 million a year to a glorified depth defenseman is a severe overpayment, whether Winnipeg care to admit it or not. And on that note, I'm going to end today's video. That was a look at every NHL team's worst free agent signing ever. What do you guys think about the various players on this list? Are you surprised to see some of the names that ended up in this video, or would you have chosen several different players instead? Let me know in the comments below, I would really love to hear what you guys think. But thank you very much for watching guys, I hope you have enjoyed. Please feel free to like, subscribe, share, or watch some of my other videos. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye! A big thank you to Clayton Hallam, Drew Fawcett, Houston NG, Lucas Gates, Raquel, and Worthless Pieces for helping support this video via Patreon. If you too want to help support the channel a little bit further and get a shout out at the end of every future video, make sure you head over to patreon.com slash oddmanrush and become a patron today.